welcome to Hot Weekly. Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan. I'm Crystal. And this is Haunt Weekly, a weekly podcast for Haunted Attraction Entertainment Community. Whether you're an actor, owner, or just plain aficionado, we aim to be a podcast for you. And it is definitely getting to be that time of year. Mm-hmm. For the first time, I think this season, I would call it seasonal weather here in New Orleans. And by that I mean like 50s, you're not really getting cold, cold. Right. Not like a, a lot of the country feels. And I know we have a lot of people in Canada that it's like, it's 50 below here and all that. But <laughs> shut up, to an Orleanian, this is at least chilly. At least it feels like proper fall weather, <laughs> probably not even yeah, like winter weather. Yeah, it's long sleeve weather. It's long sleeve weather, finally, which is which is good because I have a lot of long sleeve clothes that I never get to wear anymore. Mm-hmm. But anyways, yes, indeed, it is that time of year. The holiday season is upon us. Christmas is Saturday. Um, New Year's the Saturday after that. Mm-hmm. Or New Year's Eve Saturday after that. So, yeah, tis that time of year. Hope you are enjoying yours. And I hope you do choose to spend some of it with us. If you want more of what we're doing, check us out at HauntWeekly.com, HauntWeekly on Twitter, Facebook.com slash HauntWeekly is the Facebook page, YouTube.com slash HauntWeekly, YouTube channel. Every episode's available there. They go up the same time they go anywhere else there. Great way to stay organized and keep up to date. And once again, hopefully starting in the new year, we're going to be back to doing live broadcasts. Sunday, 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 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, hopefully that's one of the plans we have over the next two weeks. And we've got a yes. lot we're working on. Oh, yeah, and you can find us at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcast. Obviously. Yes. That should go without saying. It's where most of you get us. So I probably should tell to that. All right. Well, last week, uh, before we kick into doing our conference reminders and other stuff, we should first acknowledge this is episode 316, meaning it's time to do the, the news. news, the holiday news. Yeah. But yes, so we have a lot of great haunted attraction news coming your way and some, okay, maybe great is not the adjective I should be using for some well, of this. Well, probably not either. <laughs> And a lot's probably not true either. So we're gonna we'll admit it. We're, we'll admit it. We're kind of light on holiday news. So we're going to be focusing on one story, I think, for a good minute or two. Mm-hmm. But we also have conference reminders. But before we even get to that, we have to follow up on last week's question of the week. We were talking about ways last week to tie your Christmas haunt into your main haunt. Mm-hmm. How to make it a continuation of the story. How to make it all fit together. Right. And I think we came up with some great ideas. But we put the question out there. What is the Christmas horror character featured at haunts near you? And the most common answer we got was, there are no haunts opening for Christmas. What the hell are you talking about? (laughs) Got a lot of that. Um, I'm a little surprised. Yeah. Because it really does feel like in most metro areas, at the very least, both in the U.S. and Canada, that I'm seeing at least a couple of haunts open for the holidays. Yeah, and it's interesting because, like, a few years ago, when Christmas haunts began really taking off. They were all over the news. Yeah, Like, all over the December news. Yeah. Uh, So much so that we didn't touch on any of them. Mm -hmm. And this year, I only found two. Yeah. Two news stories. Yeah, and it's kind of bizarre. I think some of it is maybe more, maybe not all the haunts that opened last year are opening this year, open years like 2019. Mm -hmm. Like, I think 2019 was probably the peak year so far. For Christmas haunts, because 2020, obviously with the COVID restrictions, right, there was going to be some limitations. In 2021, I think we're seeing more come back, but um, staffing issues are going to be one problem. I mean, there is no labor shortage, but yeah, haunts are finding it difficult to find people willing to work for the amount haunted attractions can pay, yeah. or are willing to pay. I'm not sure which the problem is. Depends on the haunt. So, yeah, uh, this is... Uh, uh, an interesting problem here, but it'd be curious to see if more haunts continue to do it in the future and if it makes more news in the future. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, I don't know if this is a temporary hiccup in the growth of seasonal haunts or if this may be where COVID really does change the industry, you know? Yeah. By making these holiday haunts, by decreasing this particular market. But there were some great answers. Mm-hmm. Um, our good friend, friend of the podcast, Jake's Palace, said that they had Santa in the photo op, but they used multiple characters in the marketing. 
Yes, and in fact, that was one of the news stories that did come up, but is not in the notes for, so yeah. I'll just mention it. Christmas gets a horror twist at Midnight Terror Haunted House. They used a really creepy-looking elf um, actor yeah. for the photo, and she looks awesome. And, and it looked like most of the characters were traditional Christmas characters, horrified, mm-hmm. horrified, hard up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so that was interesting. Uh, <laughs> Sam Farrell. Um, said that they actually did a revenge of the basically Santa's workshop rebels against him. Think the night Santa went crazy, yeah. but in reverse. <laughs> yeah, uh, Rudolph in particular. I mean, because Rudolph does have a lot of fucking reason to hate Santa. Oh yeah, and and the other reindeers. Because I mean, as someone pointed out this year, and I hadn't actually thought about it, if Santa knows who's being naughty and who's being nice, his ass knew Rudolph was getting fucking bullied. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The fat man didn't do shit about it until Rudolph became useful. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, now I'll pay attention <laughs> Oh, now to you. you're special and money. You know what? Fuck yeah. you, Santa. You knew I was being bullied. You didn't step in and do anything. And even if you watch the Rankin Bass special, like how he just flies off to the Isle of Misfit Toys because, fuck you, I don't fit in here anymore. Mm-hmm. I don't blame Rudolph for that. My ass would be gone, too. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. So now that you need us, Santa, you need these misfit toys, you need Rudolph, mm-hmm. we're all saving the day. Woohoo! Go team. Yeah, fuck you, Santa. I agree with that. I agree with Sam Farrell on that mm-hmm. one. Sam, Rudolph deserves his moment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, most people, like I said, were like kind of struggling to understand this concept of holiday shows at haunted houses. Mm-hmm. And those that did actually were able to answer more directly, other than the Sam and Japes there basically said Krampus or Evil Santa. Yeah. So yeah, there's not a lot of variety from from what we were seeing. Yeah, and that's something I do think. If the shows are going to become more common, especially if you're going to have multiple in the same region nearby, like locally, if uh, Mortuary New Orleans Nightmare both did one, they would have to find ways to really, you know what I mean, differentiate between them, and. I, I think the obvious way is just let New Orleans Nightmare keep the whatever they're doing. They're probably, I mean, because they're part of the 13th floor, so they're probably doing something pushed from Overlord Marketing there, like through mm-hmm. into a Krampus event, probably. Mortuary, I think, should just say, it's Christmas at the Haunted Mortuary. Christmas was a major time here, even though that's kind of wrong because it's a Jewish mortuary. Yeah. So maybe that's not the best approach now that I actually stop and put two thoughts together on it. But, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. I'm just going to walk away from that one before I say anything real stupid. That sounds like a good plan. <laughs> so on that note, everyone, uh, this week's question of the week, we're not going to make this one super hot related because no, it's just not a super hot related time of year. So it's a very simple question. What is your personal favorite holiday dish? Mm-hmm. What makes it the holidays for you? Yeah. What, and so what would you say, Crystal? What would be yours? Um, probably the English pea salad. Yeah. And uh, if there's anybody out there that's like, what? Yeah. Um, explain to the kind folk what English pea salad is. You you make it. You can explain it far better than me. Um, It's young sweet peas with cheese and, and uh, some type of mayo base. Yeah. Depending on where you're at. And types of onions. It's it's a really interesting... I had not had it until I came to Louisiana. Mm-hmm. I hadn't even heard of it. I mean, the pea salad just isn't a thing, holiday or not. It's just flat out not a thing for me. So, yeah. um, hearing that, oh, we're going to have English pea salad, it's like, what? Mm-hmm. You know, I was deeply, deeply confused by it. But it actually is really, really good. And the best, the best part for me is it comes with little cheese cubes. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, and you get like the mayonnaise makes the pea stick to the cheese cubes. You take a, a fork and stab out the cheese cubes and eat them. And it's very yeah. nice. It's really awesome. And it, and it's all ingredients that you would think should not go together, but absolutely 100% do. Yeah. And let's see, mine for mine, I would have to say, uh, dressing, cornbread dressing, but with a specific caveat, which is it has to be over peppered. <laughs> Because this is a true story. This happened when I was like 12 years old. So my little brother would have been like eight. 
Mom made, uh, can't even remember if it was Thanksgiving or Christmas. It doesn't really matter. It's something that served at both. Mm -hmm. um, and she made it, but um, something went wrong. She went to dump the pepper in or something, and, like, the cat fell off, and, like, all yeah. the pepper went into the dish. Yeah. Like, the classic movie bit. Mm -hmm. And so now she has this um, cornbread dressing with, like, so much insane amounts of pepper in it. It's crazy. And I just loved it. Yeah. And this is how I, this should have been the moment I figured out I need to move to Louisiana and eat Louisiana food for the rest <laughs> of my life, right? This yeah. should have been the moment, right? Looking back on it, I always had a great love for over spi for very spicy, very hot things. Mm -hmm. uh, something of a, a culinary masochist, I guess. Yeah. But, so yeah, and I loved it. And every year after that, my mom would have to make two pans of it. Mm -hmm. One for the normal family and one for the freak Jonathan that was going to eat a whole half pan of very, very over pepper dressing. Yeah, and I will say growing up that one of the things that did make it um, Christmas versus Thanksgiving mm -hmm. dinner would be um, etouffee. Because we oh. always had etouffee with Christmas. Yeah, etouffee is uh, another interest. But you had northern Louisiana etouffee, which yes. further complicates things. I know. So, yeah, it it gets kind of weird the more you think about this. Well, yeah, because everybody's got their own etouffee, and, and it depends on where... It basically depends on your family. How did yeah. your family make it? Because it's it's different based on region and then based on family, like yeah. I said. So, yeah, it gets... Etouffee is... But it is a holiday dish. Here. Etouffee as a descriptor of a dish is not super helpful a lot of the time. It is not. You have to add other adjectives with it to mm -hmm. even get close, which is bizarre because, like, people in New Orleans and people south of I-10, basically, have a very dedicated idea of what etouffee is that is not shared by the people up north. No. <laughs> up north of that, roughly that line. I would say Opelousas is more of the correct line, but it's yeah. a little bit north of I-10. Anyways... So, yes, the question of the week, what is your favorite holiday dish? What makes it Christmas? What makes it New Year's? What makes it the holiday season? Yule, you know, Festivus, Kwanzaa, whatever you're celebrating. What makes it your time? Yes. Let us know. Once again, you can find us at HauntWeekly.com or Haunt Weekly on Twitter, Haunt Weekly on Facebook, YouTube.com slash Haunt Weekly. And anywhere you get your podcast from, just leave a comment. We read them all. Um... And by the way, we've gotten a couple of emails from listeners um, over the past few days. I'm sorry we haven't written back. It's been the holidays. And one of y'all asked a really, really good question that I wanted to put some time into about their yard haunt. Yeah. So I, I'm still working on it. I, Crystal's got it, too. We're working on it. We're going to get back shortly. It's just been a little nuts because of the time of year. Yeah. So please understand. Well, on that note, I think it's about time we kicked off the conference reminders. Crystal, would you do the honors? Sure. <laughs> January 11th through the 13th, it's Halloween and Party Expo in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's the giant trade show and Halloween and related products. This is more for what stores are going to carry during the Halloween season. So it's bulk buyers, but there are some cash and go for haunters. Yeah. Haunt Con is postponed until 2020. Yeah, there's no word Three. on what's going on. Yeah, I think it's been postponed until 2023. They haven't announced their dates yet, and it's yeah really a little late to be thinking that they will. Yeah, so HalloweenPartyExpo.com for more info on that show. Yes, excellent. All right, then after that, January 21st through the 23rd, it's Fear Expo Live in Owensboro, Kentucky at the Owensboro Convention Center. Trade show, overnight haunt tour, and a Friday after party. FearExpoLive.com for more details. Okay, February 19th through the 20th, it's Haunt X DIY Haunters and Halloween Expo in Pomona, California at the Fairplex Building 9. It'll be <laughs> featuring an asylum costume party on Saturday the 19th. HauntX.com for more info. And after that, the big one, Trans World Halloween and Attraction Show will be coming to St. Louis, Missouri, March 17th through the 20th, 2022 at the America Center, where it always is. We just need to give the dates. I think most haunters could probably find their own way to the Americas. It might be the only thing they could find their own way to in St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, indeed, it's co-located with Trans World's Christmas Show and the Room Escape Conference. Uh, still waiting on formal announcements, but you can check it out. The Ha Show, H-A-A-S-H-O-W dot com for more information. Okay, May 13th through the 15th. It's the West Coast Haunters Convention in Portland, Oregon. 
Oregon at the Doubletree Hotel Portland. The organization is a nonprofit that donates to professionals that work with autism, has two great looking parties, a costume contest, and a foam dart war, which sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, they've, they've scheduled five minutes, I think out of the last day, for a Nerf dart war. And awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's all I got. <laughs> Hauntersconvention.com for more info. And finally this week, uh, the Southeast Hall. Hollows Haunt and Convention in Savannah, Georgia, 29th, July 29th through the 31st. There'll be magicians doing demos on the show floor, a masquerade ball at Sahek. That's S-E-H-H-C dot com. I don't know why I keep pronouncing it Sahek. Mm -hmm. I don't think that bright, my brain can make that sound any other way. Yeah. So a lot of neat conferences coming up. Conferences are starting to happen again. We're going to keep our work staying on top of it, but it's been very difficult um, cause a lot of conferences are not announcing stuff until super late. And I think a lot of it's because of uncertainty with between COVID and this Omicron variant mm -hmm. and everything else. It, it would take a lot of stones to announce major plans six months in advance like we used to get. Yeah. Like we used to know everything trans world was going to do like before haunt season began. Yeah. That, that's just not the way it is right now. No. I think there's a lot of insecurity and uncertainty there. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing either. We should be kind of tentative for a little bit here. All right. Well, as we noted previously, this is about 316 divisible by four. That means it's time to do the news. And news has been a bit sparse. We're not going to lie to you. Mm -hmm. But the first story this week is it, it's a weird mix of things for me. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'll just start yeah. it off, because this is a story from the New York Post. A teenage boy dies of heart attack while touring a haunted attraction. Uh, this happened in Malaysia. A teen was basically um, visiting a quote-unquote spooky tourist site in Bintong, uh, in, in Malaysia. And I know I butcher those pronunciations, and I know someone on this who listens to this podcast is from Malaysia. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Please, please forgive me and continue listening. Yeah. Um, but yes, basically, um, according to a local news outlet, he was attending this when he got, well, they, they said shocked, but by all indications, it was a regular startle yes. from a ghost at this haunted attraction, doing air quotes around ghost, because obviously it's a person, mm -hmm. and he literally just dropped. Yeah. Um, and he was a teenager. They didn't give his ex oh, he did say he was sixteen years old. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, local and police have classified it as a sudden death. The sudden autopsy, though, revealed that this kid had a perforated heart, which is a rare but very very deadly cardiovascular condition. Mm -hmm. And that is can be combined with what is known as broken heart syndrome, which is where a period of prolonged stress right. basically weakens your heart, and that's usually very temporary. Usually. Usually. But we've kind of all been under a lot of stress these past few years. Yeah, right now, broken heart syndrome is actually on the rise in the U.S. because of COVID. Yeah, this, this is when, you, because of prolonged periods of stress, your heart weakens, and then any sudden shock or jolt can cause it to fail. And you combine that with a perforated heart, Yeah, that's just, that that's, you know, setting it up for disaster, which it seems to be exactly what happened to this poor kid. Mm -hmm. Um. And the thing about it is this, I mean, odds are we have enough people listening to this podcast that someone out there listening to this message has a serious heart condition, like perforated heart condition, mm -hmm. that they do not know about. Yes. The vast majority of very serious heart conditions don't come with symptoms. A lot of them do. Maybe not a, maybe not a vast majority, but a good number do not mm -hmm. come with any symptoms. Right. And so, first thing is first, before we get into this, please take your cardiovascular health seriously. Mm -hmm. Please, 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 please take it seriously. Don't faff around with these some any issues you have. If you sense that something is wrong, get a doctor to check it out. You know, get it looked at. I actually had an abnormal EKG mm -hmm. a while back. This was very scary for me. I was in, just trying to get clearance for a surgery that was not connected to my heart in any way. Well, I guess everything's connected to your heart, but you know what I meant. Yeah. It wasn't heart surgery. So the point I'm trying to get at. Right. I was trying to get brain surgery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I went in for what I thought was just a routine EKG, 
And they're like, oh, no, you've got an issue. And it turns out I was on uh, the blood pressure medicine I was on was causing a heart arrhythmia, mm-hmm. which over time could have gotten extremely serious. Right. So they changed my meds, and now my EKGs are perfectly fine and normal. I'm ding in all the right places, and everything's great. Yes, the cardiologist fired you as yeah, I got, a patient. Yeah, I got fired as a patient. I'm like, you don't need a cardiologist. Get the fuck out of here, basically is what I was told. Yeah. I got sick people to tend, kid. Get out of here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, you wasn't wrong. But... But the point is, get that shit checked out, get your EKGs, get that shit done, because you do not know, you know, what you may have and what may be. And a lot of heart conditions, if caught early, are very, very treatable. My dad just survived major heart surgery himself. Mm -hmm. This was caught by his doctor on an EKG. It was nothing he felt. Yeah. So, and he's now back to playing disc golf and annoying the shit out of everyone he can again. So, (laughs) apparently major success. (laughs) You know, but so, yeah, basically, that's the first thing. Take your cardiovascular health seriously. Now, about the story, I didn't believe it the first three or four times I read it. No, because it it sounds like an urban legend. legend. Yeah. Yeah. We've heard these stories a million times. Oh, that's the haunt. Some kid died. Yeah. Yeah, Some kid went there, boom, dropped dead. Or someone. Or someone died. And yeah. And I mean, there is the famous story from the House of Shock of a guy who had a heart attack in the haunt, and they was rescued by EMTs on site. Mm-hmm. Which is, this is part of why you have EMTs on site. Because uh, something, anything can happen. Right. And you can say on your little warning signs, don't go in if you have a heart condition. And you may mean that. But once again, what we just talked about here, there's tons of very dangerous heart conditions that people don't know about. You know what I mean? John Ritter died of one, for the love of God. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, got to keep that in mind. People are not aware of the heart conditions they do have. Mm -hmm. And I was reading that, and when I finally was convinced this actually happened, and I I pulled it from another American source and some local papers, Mm -hmm. and there's actually video of it, too, which I did not watch the video. I'm not going to do that. (laughs) Yeah, I saw that that it existed. I did not watch it either. I don't feel the need to watch a teenager no. die today. That's, it's the wrong. It's the wrong time. Anytime's the wrong time of year. Now is especially the wrong time of year. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah, I'm not doing that. Sorry, y'all. But basically, now that I'm, I, I know for certain it's real. Um, you know, it's it's just a reminder. This is why you have to have medical staff and trained people there on site, even if it's not an EMT. People that are first aid trained people. And you need to have the equipment there, too, a defibrillator. They've got smart defibrillators now that literally anybody can use. Yeah. You've never used a defibrillator before? Fine. Doesn't matter. They take it out. They have the instructions there on how to use it. And it does the heart read. It does a little EKG. It reads the heart. Mm-hmm. And it does what it sees as appropriate. Yeah. So have the equipment. Have the people there. Have it handy just in case something like this does happen. And once again, he was 16. Yeah, and I do think that with, you know, the rise of the broken heart syndrome, that it's something that we definitely need to look at as an industry to keeping if you don't already have one. Yeah. I I think those um, public use defibrillators are an awesome idea Mm -hmm. for a haunted attraction. Having one on site in a place where it can get to any spot in the haunt fairly quickly is an amazingly important thing to do. And... You know, obviously, if you can, EMTs are on site, or EMTs on staff, as we found to be one of the handiest ways to take care of that. Yeah, it is. But get people first aid trained, because people, you you never know when a customer who looks fit, looks healthy, healthy-looking 16-year-old kid here, just drops dead. And yeah, and to be clear, it's not that this haunt did anything wrong. No. By all accounts, emergency personnel were there. They got him, and they were trying to rescue him. Mm -hmm. The split second he hit the ground, he was getting help the very millisecond they could. The haunt did nothing wrong. Sorry if I'm giving that impression. That's not the goal. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But this is a reminder, because I I genuinely think in this case, he could not be helped. They they did everything right, Mm -hmm. and that sucks. Sometimes it's possible to make no mistakes and still lose. Yeah. That's what happened here. Um. But that doesn't mean you should play fast and loose with this. Mm-hmm. So please, if you are at, if you run a haunt or you have a haunt that does not have this equipment or does not have the people handy um, when you're open, 
now's a good time to start working on it. Now's a great time to start thinking about it. This is a good reminder. A long way from season. Mm-hmm. You should be done with the postseason stuff. You're in that little break. Put this on your to-do list for when you start work soon. Yeah, and a lot of Red Cross, um, local Red Cross area, mm-hmm. have training available throughout the year on CPR and defibrillator use. Yeah. Um, so just check and see what's what's on the schedule and what you can get your people certified in. Yeah, this is just one of those things where I really and truly believe haunts. Um, Haunts obviously do this to their own ability and to their own, you know, how much they care about it, honestly. Mm -hmm. Some haunts are great, (laughs) have all the equipment there, have the people there. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some where it's like, if anybody has a medical issue here that can't be covered by a first aid kit from Walgreens, we're screwed. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, I've seen both. I've seen ones, I've I've been in haunts where it's like, well, if I'm going to pass out, this is where I want it to be. And then I've seen ones like, oh, God, please don't let me get a rusty nail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So please, be thinking about that. All right. Well, next up, we'll go switch to some happy news. Yeah. Oh. Um. So. So, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, now Scream Park <laughs> in Michigan has raised more than $124,000 for local groups. This is from MoodyOnTheMarket.com. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, this is the 48th year that they've run the project, the Scream Park project. And it helps more than 50 area children organizations, civic groups, and other charities as mm-hmm. well. Yeah. So, so and, and what's fascinating about it is this is their 48th year. Yeah. That is, I think, the second longest consecutive running haunted house I'm aware of. Yeah. I think it, Waterloo it, beats them by a couple of years. I think Waterloo was celebrating 48 when we were there last. Mm-hmm. So they beat them by a couple. That's it. I mean, cause, I mean, we're in 2020. So, you know, we're 2021. That's almost 50 years ago. So that makes it means they started in the 70s, early 70s. Yeah. That's the JC era. That's, yeah. And they just started, you know, calculating, or, or it looks like from this article, they started keeping track of donations. <laughs> At some point, and, they decided to write that shit in down. In 1996, <laughs> because since 96, they've donated over $2.2 million. At some point, you do want to start writing shit down. I think that's, yeah. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. So, yeah, $2.2 million. And this is one of the things I love about this industry is the charity good it can do. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. yeah. But over, I mean, and here's the other thing that's impressive. Over 21,000 hours were volunteered by 400 different people. Yeah, and they put on seven different attractions. Yeah. So that's that's pretty amazing. That's an amazing job there, and it's good yeah, and, for the community. It's and good. that means the average person donated fifty two an hour and a half hours. Yeah, that's the average person. Obviously, a lot of people donated a lot more. Yeah, and some people donated yeah. less. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, that's the case. But still, that is an impressive number of hours, and it was twenty three nights of operation. So. Wow, kudos, guys. Seven attractions. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. Even if they're small attractions, small as in like our size haunt, like, you know, underneath a thousand square feet, that's still a lot of fucking haunted attraction to manage. All volunteer, all for charity, raised 2.2 million. I am just blown over since 1996. I'm blown away by this. Y'all, this is amazing. And this is what they were able to donate. This is after their, I'm assuming after operating costs right. are removed. Yeah. So the, I mean, I'm assuming revenue was much, much higher. This is after operating costs are covered. Mm-hmm. And that is impressive. And we have seen firsthand in our area how powerful a haunted house charity can be for an organization. The Chinchuba House mm-hmm. uh, was very much responsible for keeping that organization afloat. And after it was forced to close, Chinchubas itself did not last long. It was literally the lifeblood for that charity. I mean, it's sad and it's very tragic considering the great work they do in teaching deaf children. Right. Or they did in teaching deaf children, but yeah, they, it was not sustainable after the haunt closed. No. Yeah, you know, they lost their primary source of revenue, basically. So, all right. Well, another haunt charity related news. A holiday-themed haunt is raising money for cancer patients in Kentucky. This is an article from WYMT. Mm-hmm. Um, haunted attraction in Lico, 
Haunted Forest and Leslie, oh, it's Lico Haunted Forest in Leslie County, is traded, uh, it scares for holiday cheer. Basically, they have created, a, they say it's a holiday maze. Never call it a maze, kids. It's a labyrinth. <laughs> Fire marshals hear maze, they get antsy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but basically, all the proceeds are are going to cancer patients in the county, and basically, it's the uh, Lico Haunted Forest, Annette, and Oscar Mosley Memorial Cancer Fund. Yeah, yeah. Base the uh, coordinator Jordan Joseph who yeah. puts it on um, said that he had lost a, a lot of family members due to cancer, so that's why that was the inspiration to start the holiday walk through. And the uh, memorial fund. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. And honestly, this is another another great thing. And another and you know, I don't know much about uh, Leslie County, mm-hmm. but my feeling from this article is that it's not the biggest of counties. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it. But this is another example of how a haunted attraction can help underserved areas because right. you can open up a haunted attraction in a county or a parish that is maybe not being served as big by the city charities and so forth, maybe isn't getting that, bring in money that can do a lot of good in, a, in an area that where not a ton of money can do a lot of good. Because that's one of the things I always seek out whenever I do try to give money or do try to donate is, hey, I don't have a lot of money to give. How do I maximize the impact? How do I make it so that this is a big part of a charity's success? And that's why we like Ween Dream, for example, when mm-hmm. we were working with them. And basically, um, we knew their annual budget was low four figures, basically. Yeah. They, they got costumes donated, and their whole thing was mailing them, sending them out. Right. So they spend a lot on shipping. But, you know, they have high shipping costs, and a few hundred dollars from someone like us mm-hmm. can make a huge difference. Yeah, exactly. And they also do the um, an Amazon wish list if you're yeah. interested in, in helping them out by buying things if you don't feel comfortable just sending money. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I agree. And they have a, a – yeah, I mean, really great. I don't think they've been in operation these past two years because of COVID and the very nature of sending costumes. Right. It's, it's kind of weird in a COVID times. But still, excellent charity, excellent people behind it. And one of the reasons we continue to support them is because we know as little as we can donate comfortably, that's a huge help. It means a lot to them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it helps a lot of people. Yep. All right, moving on. Okay. This is the only one that I've heard of doing this. So okay. Dread Hollow um, in Chattanooga, Tennessee is doing a New Year's Nightmare. So I haven't heard of any other haunts doing New Year's Eve no, no. specific events. <laughs> And that's why this one's included. It's a special edition haunt and escape rooms for two night only, January 1st and 8th, um, from 8 to 10. But, and they are, um, still doing time tickets only. You cannot buy tickets at the door. Good on them. Um, so yeah, it seems like it would be fun. Yeah, um... I'm very curious what they do for the theme and how they decorate and how they sort of bake this in. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, Christmas, even if you don't celebrate Christmas, the the visual language of Christmas is very immediately recognized. Yeah. Christmas trees, holiday lights, all that. The only visual language I have with New Year's is those stupid 2020 glasses. (laughs) Yeah, basically the year, the new year yeah. being out there, and sometimes New Year's Baby, yeah. which is terrifying. Yeah, the New Year's Baby is genuinely terrifying. Then again, and babies in general are terrifying. Mm-hmm. Like, we just don't want to have that conversation. Ever since the fucking King Cake Baby became a thing here in New Orleans, and I don't mean like the actual baby in the King Cake, I mean the King Cake Baby mascot. Yeah. I just, I can't deal with it, man. That's a fucking terrifying baby, and it? Yes, yes, it, it is. It needs to go to fuck, go to fuck away from me. He's where it needs to go. Needs to, yeah. I need a fucking restraining order against the king cake baby. Right. <laughs> Ain't met it yet. I'm keeping it that way, motherfucker. <laughs> so, yeah, just an interesting idea to do a New Year's haunt. The theming, the visuals, all that's going to mm-hmm. be very interesting. Honestly, I think it's a great idea, though. And like I said, I've been a big proponent of trying to expand more years, expand the season, and get open more dates. Um, but right now, 
part of what that means is trying to find a way to make it so that each show feels special. Because one mm-hmm. of the reasons why haunted attractions work in areas where you're not getting high tourist volume. Right. So you're pulling from the same populations that each show feels special. And there's that FOMO, that fear of missing out the very special thing that's happening. Right. And so we have to deal with that if you're in a place with a static population. Now, if you're in a place like, you know, we talked with them, you know, in Galveston, where you have a regular tourist population cycling through, cycling through you can just keep bringing the tourists in because it's always new to tourists. Exactly. <laughs> but if you don't have, if you're not in a tourist location, then, yeah, you have to find a way to make each show feel special, feel unique, and like something that the locals will not want to miss. Mm-hmm. All right, moving on. So, this one has me a little confused. I read the article, but I, <laughs> but it's a fascinating idea. Um, basically, in Japan, the headline reads, School Days Haunted House to Appear on Christmas Eve. And this is from SiliconEra.com. Um, but basically, on Christmas Eve, the same people that did the sk- the scream- the screambulances, yes. we reported on them previously. Right. Um, they basically, because of COVID and the fact that they were kind of limited in how they could operate, they had this idea of creating screambulances where you go on a ride. Well, it was a it was a drive-in thing. Yeah, yeah. They drove you through the thing, though. Yeah. They drove you through it. Yeah. And so that was very, very cool and a very novel idea. Well, apparently they are continuing that mm-hmm. um, by having a Christmas Eve special. Right. Um. But now they will come to you. You can book them to come to your house or your event Yeah, to do this. Yeah, it's a haunted delivery service. You make the reservations online. They come to your house. They pick you up. And, yeah, they're also putting them in places like amusement parks and shopping centers. They're really trying to turn the screambulance into a, 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 fen- a cultural phenomenon in Japan. Yeah, and basically they do have shaking seats, spraying water, um the big baddie is supposed to actually attack the the outside mm-hmm. at the end and the original cast has returned the four girls who were the original cast has returned also yeah and i, I do love that the name of the company mm-hmm. uh is a tie I, 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 have, I have no hope of pronouncing that right but it translates to scaring corp scaring corp yeah i just love that scaring corp i mean how the hell is that not a haunted house name here yeah i know right <laughs> Or a name for a haunted house crew. We're the Scaring Corps. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you've heard of the Marine Corps. <laughs> We're the Scaring Corps. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, moving on. Okay, so the iconic Miracle Strip ride has opened a Christmas attraction, and this is in Santa's World in Oxford, Alabama. Um, I have a lot of questions about Santa's Wonderland being in Oxford, Alabama, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. But Jeremy Cruz, who was the original haunted castle at Miracle Strip Amusement Park in Panama City, mm-hmm. has created this Wonderland attraction. So mm-hmm. it's good to see that he's still out there creating attractions for people. Yeah. But lots of people talk about the ad for the haunted castle because mm-hmm. um, it was very popular in the, the 80s. Yeah. In fact, it was making its rounds. During COVID time, like during the lockdown, a mm-hmm. lot of the haunted attraction groups were digging up the old ads for the haunted castle. Yeah. So yeah, fascinating that yeah. he's still doing things in in Alabama. Meaning that's feasible. We could go see it sometime. We could. And go to Santa's Wonderland to see a new haunted attraction. Yeah, that just sounds so wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's just by the guy who who did a haunted attraction. I don't think it is a haunted attraction. Yeah, that's true. You're right. But anyways. So that'll be a lot of fun. Now, this last one, uh, we're putting in mostly for fun. Yeah. <laughs> Funsies. And to pad a little more time. But I'm actually really excited about this after reading this article. <laughs> um, if you like Stardew Valley. Mm-hmm. Which it, we actually all played together. Yeah, we house. actually did enjoy it. Yeah. We actually, it was a lot of fun. We, we fell out of it faster than a lot of people did. Yeah, Ellie um, continued after we Yeah, started. Ellie kept it up for a long, long time. I think she got... Um, a couple of in-game years in. Yeah. And she kept it going. She really got into it for a while there. It was all she could do <laughs> was start it, or eat, work, Stardew Valley. Mm-hmm. Well, the uh, developer behind it is working on a new game. Mm-hmm. And this is from GameRant.com. It's called The Haunted Chocolatier. And 
when you look at the screenshots, if you look at the screenshots in the article, and you right. should, you should absolutely go to this link, it looks very Stardew Valley-ish. It does. Same perspective, same artwork style, very similar artwork mm-hmm. style, at least. But noticeably a little spookier. Yeah. Would that be a way to put it? Yeah, and, and Stardew did have some spooky yeah. things once you got deeper into the game. Yeah, yeah, once you got, especially like the mines and so forth. Yeah, exactly. Stardew Valley got a little bit creepier, but this is basically the idea is it's centered around the the, the, you know, the haunted chocolatier. I mean, no, I mean, it's in the name. <laughs> it's in the name. I mean, what do you want? And basically, he runs a haunted chocolatier um, where he employs ghosts to make chocolate. And the whole point of it is that this is supposed to be like a spookified version of Stardew Valley, complete mm-hmm. with mysteries and ghosts and things like that. Yeah, and he has to battle monsters mm-hmm. that are are bigger than the ones in Stardew. Yeah, so and it's, more it's, monstery, I guess. I guess so. I to to get the ingredients to make the chocolate. So I guess the chocolate is also haunted. I don't know. What is he making? I, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look, it's it's, it's going to have to be one of those that you play it to see what where this goes. I, I think one of the problems is having played Stardew Valley. We should know you cannot apply Stardew Valley logic to our day to day life. No. And everything we know about the universe. Because Stardew Valley logic exists in a completely different sphere. Mm-hmm. You're never going to get anywhere if you try to apply our logic to it. So, yeah, obviously we're going to have to play this and see. But it looks really awesome. And I did enjoy Stardew Valley. And I, cause I, I've really gotten to a point in my life where I enjoy those chill vibe kinds of games. Mm-hmm. Where it's not, you know, super stressy and super anxiety. And that you can pick up and put down... Yeah, I like those kinds of games a lot, and I've, I, especially as I get older, and I deal with enough stress in my day job, and I have less consistent time to play video games. Mm-hmm. I really enjoy that. So Stardew Valley was very much up my alley. <clears throat> I regret dropping it as quickly as I did, um, but yeah, this looks like a lot of fun. It looks like it's going to be a game a lot of haunters are going to want to try out. Well, I think that's all we have this week. I know we're wrapping up a few minutes early. We usually try to make these about 50 minutes long, but it's the holidays. We've been swapped. News has been light. Hopefully, you'll begrudge us these few minutes. Yes. <laughs> Not cutting it too, too short or anything. Well, on that note, everyone, thank you very much for spending the past 45 or so minutes with us. We greatly appreciate you. Hope your holiday season is going well. And hope you were getting all the gifts and all of the excitement and all the merriment you wanted out of these special days. This has been Haunt Weekly, episode 316, doing the news. For more Haunt Weekly, travel yourself to hauntweekly.com, Haunt Weekly on Twitter, Haunt Weekly on Facebook, youtube.com slash hauntweekly is the YouTube channel. Every episode's there. Really easy stuff. Really great, too. That's how often we find our best episodes sometimes. Mm-hmm. You think we're kidding. Um... You can also catch us at Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you find your podcast. You'll find us there. Until next time, though, I'm Jonathan. I'm Crystal. And we will see you all next week as we gear up for some kind of year-end review, most likely. I have a feeling that's what's coming, but we'll see you all then.